All right, I think we've got everybody back. Um, Madam reporter, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, Madam Clerk, are we ready? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll continue with the uh, Mr. Pryor's examination of Dr. Davidson. I'll remind you, Dr. Davidson, you're still under oath. Mr. Pryor, you can continue your direct. You're on mute, Mr. Pryor. Dr. Davidson, as part of your analysis and evaluation of this particular case, uh, you prepared a report, is that correct? Yes. And that report is 24 pages uh, um, and it's been signed by you. And uh, uh, my understanding is it's been provided to the court by Mr. Means, provided to Mr. Wood, uh, provided to me as well. Uh, judge, at this time, I'm gonna move for admission of uh, Dr. Davidson's report as an exhibit. Uh, first, we'd need to have it marked. That would be exhibit three, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry, Judge, I thought it had already been marked. I apologize. So um, uh, I have it down as exhibit number four, but if the court wants to put that down as exhibit number three, that's fine. Uh, we can use whatever number you want, Mr. Pryor. I don't know. We've had one and two admitted, so I was just let's Let's stick with this. The court suggested exhibit number three and have that marked as exhibit number three, and then I move for admission of the exhibit. All right. Uh, the report of Dr. Davidson uh, dated December 31st is marked as exhibit three. Is there any objection to the admission of the report, uh, Mr. Evans? No, Your Honor. Okay. Then by uh, the exhibit is admitted exhibit number three, and that is Dr. Davidson's report. And may I proceed, Your Honor? Judge, may I proceed? My apologies, yes, you may, Mr. Pryor. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Dr. Davidson, uh, uh, I can't have you look at your report while you're testifying, but at any time during this process that you feel that you need your recollection refreshed, I would ask you to pull out your report, review it, and then when you are done, set the report aside after your recollection has been refreshed, and then testify on, on that refreshed knowledge. Uh, I assume you've been through that before, but uh, uh, are, are, do you understand that, uh, Dr. Davidson? I do. Okay. So, Dr. Davidson, I'm uh, going to start uh, at the beginning of your report, uh, and that's on page seven of the report. And, Judge, the difficulty with this Zoom is, uh, unfortunately, my uh, I may have education experience, uh, 25 years of doing this, but technological experience is incredibly limited. So, I don't know how I can get the report on the screen, uh, but I will refer by by a, a page number and paragraph, and I believe all the parties have that report, if that's acceptable to the court. That would be fine with me. I do have a copy I can view here. Okay. And Dr. Davidson, do you have a copy of your report with you? I do. Okay. And again, I do not want you to look at the report while you are testifying. If at some point you don't have a clear recollection of what you put in the report, advise me, and we'll go through the process of refreshing your recollection uh, so that we uh, follow the rules as they are uh, uh, set forth uh, that we're guided by. Do you understand that? I do. Okay. So Dr. Davidson, on page seven of your report, uh, you started out with uh, the first statement that Mr. Wood made on the recording. Everyone is kind of running down the kid's case because they were last seen in Rexburg and you were living in Rexburg. And then there's some narrative after that in your report. Uh, you made a conclusion based on uh, that narrative uh, where, uh, with the last statement being that um, we are going to be filing conspiracy to commit murder charges against both Chad and Lori. And what was that conclusion you made after listening to and reviewing that narrative? It's going to be difficult to recall these, this, these pieces on such a micro level. Uh, do you want to tell me a little bit more about the narrative? Or, or... Well, I would have you refer to page seven of your report, Dr. Davidson. Give me a second. Got it. 
And if you would read uh, the middle of your uh, page of your report where it starts with uh, Robert Wood being highlighted and read down to the words, uh, uh, Garrett, okay. Uh, okay, so I, I don't have anything highlighted in my report, but are you talking about Robert Wood with Tylee was last seen? Or yes, and then you made a conclusion at the end of your report, you made a conclusion with a check mark. Exactly. So uh, what I need you to do before you testify is review your recollection of that uh, 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 finding that you made and then set the report aside and then testify. What I'll do is I'll just make it as clear as I can. I'm doing a quick scan and here's my finding and if that's inadequate or troublesome, uh, any of you can let me know. Okay. So uh, looking at that, uh, scanning that information, the conclusion I had was that um, this would be a type of bias that I call inner circle bias. Okay. And inner circle bias is a situation where witnesses provided with uh, information that's not known to the general public. And so uh, it's an effort to include the witness in sort of the inner circle uh, of information. And uh, as a result, it can be uh, co-opting of that person uh, to, to really join whatever that inner circle is. Uh, so that would be the, the, the bias that I believe was active in that particular interchange. And the interchange is where he talks about um, seeing the kids in Yellowstone and then the, his decision of telling Ms. Shiflett that he's gonna file murder charges against Chad and Lori, is that correct? That's correct. And co-opting, talk a little bit about the co-opting. Um, co-opting is, uh, can be very, very obvious or it can be very subtle, but co-opting is a, the manner in which you kind of pull a person into your viewpoint. Uh, so for example, uh, just as a totally different example, uh, because, uh, earlier, um, uh, I mentioned abuse, uh, we could talk about how. Uh, say everyone knows that people that abuse children uh, really are pretty bad, right? And uh, what you should know here is that we have information to that effect. So what I'm doing is I'm informing someone and also kind of setting the expectation that they would align with me in my group that would, that would be um, opposed to whatever the other group does or is. So when you're talking about groups, what you're in essence saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, is that uh, the statement by Mr. Means to uh, uh, express to a material witness that uh, in the future, these charges are gonna be coming. It's his attempt to bring that witness to his side and just and basically push the other side, i.e. the defense away. Is that fair? Your Honor, objection, your honor, counsel's testifying. Saying that objection, I think it also must say to you, indicated Mr. Means had said that. So why don't you re-ask the question in a different okay. way? Prior. When you're talking about uh, uh, dividing the uh, particular parties, uh, the bias you're talking about is for the prosecuting attorney to uh, to bring him or to bring Summer Shiflet into his side of the uh, uh, the case. Is that fair? Your Honor, again, counsel's testifying. Uh, this is a direct examination, not a cross. Uh, What's the purpose of the bias? Uh, uh, Mr. Pryor, well, I'm, I'm not done with the objection ruling, so I am sustaining the objection. Oh, I'm sorry. Another question. What is the purpose of the, uh, 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 the in this particular case, specifically uh, bringing a uh, witness into the inner circle? Well, I would have to speculate as to the purpose because I, I don't know the prosecutor's purpose. I'm just identifying the nature of the bias that's involved, which is what I would call inner circle bias. Okay. And is this inner circle bias, uh, in your opinion, an attempt to influence a witness? It could be construed that way. Um, again, I'm, I don't have the purposefulness behind it from, uh, in this case of the prosecutor, but the whether it's intentional or unintentional, that bias can have easily that consequence. That's why it's called a bias. Okay, so it's not a matter of whether there was an attempt to influence a witness, it's whether it was purposeful or unintentional. Is that fair? I don't think I can speak to purpose. 
what I what I'm trying to say here is to back up earlier to my testimony. Best practices argues to minimize bias in any form because it can lead to intentionally or unintentionally manipulation, coercion, setting expectations for how somebody would testify and so forth. And so inner circle bias is going to be a type of bias that will try to, uh, again, inadvertently or advertently, draw that person into the inner circle, align with the person's inner circle and their viewpoint and the scope of what they may speak about or testify to. So I need a bit of a clarification. When you're talking about someone drawing someone into the inner circle, you're talking about the person who provides that information and you are sending that message to someone to draw them into your inner circle. Correct. It's initiated by the questioner or initiated by the person who uh, is taking the lead in a meeting and the effort is to draw them into that person's circle, not the witness's circle, but in this case, a prosecutorial circle. So when Mr. Wood comments that he's going to bring these murder charges against Chad and Lori, uh, it's your position that that could be construed as Mr. Wood trying to draw Summer Shiflet into his inner circle. Uh, I would probably not necessarily say that with the example you gave, I would probably say that that would then become a statement that would likely very much alarm a witness and have them wondering, what do I do to avoid that potential charge? So in other words, uh, the, the <laughs> go ahead, I'm please. Well, I, I don't think that would draw somebody into the inner circle of I'm, I'm advocating for a capital charge. Okay. I don't, I don't think that would be the, the impact of that particular statement. Okay, so what you're suggesting, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, the, that statement have, have, uh, that statement would have the impact of, of uh, causing the person, uh, in this case, Summer Shiflet, to uh, uh, offer information that would avoid that consequence. Uh, that would be a, a, a good possible conclusion, yes. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next part where it starts with uh, um, Garrett OK on your report on page seven. And if you would read down to the bottom of page 24, I would appreciate it to refresh your recollection. Okay. Let me look real quick. So uh, it says Garrett OK, uh, Robert Wood, and we're not shy about that. We've told both attorneys. His attorney keeps pretending like I've never said that. Do you want me to read it out loud like I'm doing? By all means, if you want to, that's fine. Okay. And it says what, but we are, we have to, but I kind of want to give you a little bit of background of where we are and kind of our theory of how this ended up where it was. We know that this is not the same Lori everyone else knew. What's so strange to me is everyone we talked to, everyone we talked to who knew Lori before this, she was primary president. She made quilts for these kids. She made everything fun. Everyone loved her. She loved everyone. Okay. And then you come up with some uh, 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 comment with a check mark. And if you would read that comment and then set it aside and, and, and tell me what your uh, uh, analysis is in that regard. Well, to the bottom of 24, there's one comment and then there's two more in the top of 25 that are related to that passage. I wanted to do it one at a time just so we didn't become confused. So the, at the bottom of 24, that says uh, best practice, mutual activity. The mutual activity of listening to this witness has yet to occur. The prosecution is actually testifying to the theory of the case, which risks influencing the witness narrative. No open-ended questions or active listening has occurred. The task of interviewing the witness is trumped by case information. What do you mean by that then? Well, what I mean is the stage is being set here uh, for, uh, the, for the prosecutor informing the witness of the purpose uh, of this meeting. Uh, that we're not getting into um, questioning her or just welcoming her to uh, the day of questioning later in the interview. Uh, what's happening here is the mutual activity. The reason we're here, uh, if I start only with this piece, the reason we're here is to understand better uh, my viewpoints as a prosecutor of the theory of the case and what I'm anticipating or expecting uh, your reaction might be to that. 
Uh, so the mutual activity for a person who came in for an interview as a witness is quite different in this meeting. It's not a mutual activity as being interviewed as a witness. Mutual activity is to be informed of the theory of the case. Okay. And then you go on on the next page, which would be page eight of your report, and you talk about bias. And would you uh, review that uh, provision and then be prepared to testify about what you uh, uh, mean by that? Um, yes. Uh, give me one second. Sure, I'm ready to go with that if you'd like. Okay, let's talk about the bias and the derogation. Well, the derogation comes with the extracurricular comment about the defense attorney. Uh, the defense attorney is not listening, for example. Um, and so when you have a person who has great con influence over the proceedings, uh, the prosecutor in this case for the state, when they derogate the defense attorney, uh, what's happening is really a not so subtle statement uh, that uh, this person should, should be really disregarded. This person is not a person who uh, carries any, any real weight. They're just not thinking clearly. Uh, and the impact of that, if, if I'm a potential witness, uh, now is to, to have to determine, well, whose side am I going to be on? And, and who do I really listen to? Uh, and hmm, uh, since we've had uh, clarity on things like death penalty, uh, who, who do I really want to, to try to speak to? Because apparently the other person, the, the defense attorney for my sister is, is, is simply not with the program. Okay. And then you went on to, um, um, you went on to talk about in-group versus out-group in your report. Explain that for me, would you please? Right. Um, well, the in-group and the out-group, again, is, in this case, uh, the prosecutor in providing the theory of the case is letting us know that his, his group is the in-group. This is why there is this education on his theory of the case. The out-group with the incompetent or the uh, clueless uh, defense attorney, if you will, uh, is, is the other group. And that happens to be the group that um, uh, I mentioned before with derogation. So when you have an in-group, out-group bias, what you're really doing is you're laying the foundation or the seeds for a witness to be able to decide who are you going to really align with. The problem is, if we go back to best practice, they shouldn't align with anybody. The focus should have been, what do you have to tell us that's, that's reliable for this case and the information pertaining to the case? What's your information? Not, not what your, is, is your alignment. Okay. Uh, and the next paragraph, it starts with Summer Shiflet saying, great mom. Uh, Mr. Wood makes a comment and then you come to a conclusion as well. Uh, would you take the opportunity to refresh your recollection on that paragraph and then let me know when you're ready? Okay, just a minute. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, so Summer Shiflet uh, makes a comment that says, great mom. Uh, Mr. Wood makes some comments. Uh, if you would be so kind as to read Mr. Wood's comments. Um, great mother, that's what everyone says and you know. So one thing I'm going to ask of you to consider is maybe something happened. I don't know what, I don't know if it was psychological. I don't know, I, I don't know if we'll ever know. But something happened, and I think Colby, the way he said it to me, I think, uh, is kind of the person who is in that jail cell is not my mom, it's someone else. Okay. So you could, came to a, uh, a determination, and there's a check mark in your report in the middle of page eight that says bias. Would you explain your analysis? Yes. Uh, confirmatory bias is what I noted, and confirmatory bias is when a person presents information selectively to confirm their viewpoint of something. And so in this particular case, uh, the uh, viewpoint that's being presented and confirmed is, 
Well, it looks like um, uh, she's in, uh, involved, but she's a different person. She's someone else. And so we have here an example of confirmatory bias where we have an evaluative statement about the defendant by the prosecutor to a witness before that witness, witness has been interviewed. Uh, that's a problem. Okay. Does that rise to the level of trying to influence a witness? Well, again, that's going to be a matter of, of my determining purpose. But if I can slightly modify your, your question, I would say, can that lead to influencing a witness? Not you know, Was that the purpose of it? The, yes, it absolutely can lead uh, to influence influencing a witness. Okay. It is not a best practice approach. Okay. And, and is, this an ever, is this ever an acceptable... Uh, practice in interviewing a witness, this, uh, uh, this confirmatory questioning in this way? Uh, I'm only smiling because in a bad read technique interrogation, the answer is yes, but this is neither uh, in that situation at all. So the answer is no, this is not appropriate. You're trying to get untainted, raw information that's reliable from a witness about a case. This is not that example. Okay, so this is actually an example of trying to taint the information you're getting from a witness. Is, is that right? It would be an example of that, yes. Of tainting a witness's testimony. Correct. Okay, let's move on where it says, Summer Shiflet, yeah. And that's in the middle of page eight of your report. If you would be so kind as to review the rest of page eight. Uh, and actually that would go through uh, to the bottom of page eight, just before it says Summer Shivlet. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, why don't you uh, state what Mr. Wood said and it starts with the flip side. <clears throat> uh, the flip side of that is, I shouldn't say the flip side, but I wanna be clear. I'm not going to pull any punches on any defendant in this case, right? I've got my job to do. And, and Summer Shifflett says, absolutely. And uh, Mr. Wood says, but we also want the truth and the whole truth and the context of it. And Chad Daybell is, did you ever meet Chad? And then uh, at the bottom, Summer Shifflett of this page says, so I met him once at a preparing people. I went to one preparing people thing. Okay, and then you, uh, between the Summer Shiflet and Mr. Wood, you talked about acquiescence and bias. Would you elaborate on what your finding is in that regard? Right, uh, one method of, of bias or one uh, aspect of bias called acquiescence is when you ask questions in such a way that you elicit confirming responses or, or negative responses uh, from uh, the person that you're talking to. Uh, so as an example of an acquiescence, it would be like, uh, so um, you, you met this person, correct? Yes. Uh, they aren't very nice, are they? Uh, no. Uh, so you, 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 you would ask questions where this person's agreeing with the questioner. And that acquiescence, if it continues across an interview, really shows a shaping of the testimony or the nature of the reply from the interviewee rather than an open-ended, neutral kind of investigation. So in this particular case, I'm saying that there's acquiescence because the first beginning of the pattern is she says, absolutely. Okay. So uh, is this a situation again, where the witness testimony may be manipulated or uh, influenced by this acquiescence? The nature of the questioning, if it's repetitive and leads to acquiescent responses, does shape the nature of that person's testimony. Without a doubt? Well, there's always doubt, but that's why we would use open-ended questions because it doesn't demand a yes or a no or an absolutely or a never. It just requests a narrative. Here we have questions that are demanding a yes or a no, or the person's volunteering it, which goes back now to in-group and out-group kinds of, of bias because they're confirming I'm in your group. Okay. And by her comment, uh, absolutely. And, and throughout this report, Ms. Shiflett is confirming that she's in Mr. Wood's group. 
By the time you get done with the report, that's correct. Okay. Now you noted in your uh, report on the last line of acquiescence bias that this pattern of witness acquiescence repeats throughout this interview. You saw other instances where Mr. Wood and Ms. Shiflett engaged in this bias acquiescence. Is that fair? Yes, I literally went through and, and uh, at one point actually counted the number of acquiescent responses. I don't recall the number, but yes. And was it numerous? It was almost 100%. Okay. So then you went on to mutual activity best, practice, best practices uh, in your report. Would you explain that for me? Yes. Uh, she's present voluntarily in my understanding to be interviewed. Uh, so we actually have an interview question but it is a closed end question rather than open-ended. Do, do you know Chad Daybell? Yes or no is the you know, answer. Uh, and the activity then that begins to be defined is A, I want to educate you on the theory of my case and B, if I'm gonna proceed with questioning, they're going to be closed end questions instead of open-ended questions. And in this particular case, this wasn't so much uh, a, a pattern of asking questions as it was a dissertation of his, uh, Mr. Wood's opinion of the case. Is that fair? Uh, that's correct. There's literally, this is the only question that was asked. Right. Okay. So let's move on with your report to page nine, if we could, sir. Okay. And if you would re read the first uh, uh, up uh, part of page nine and, 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 uh, stop after your analysis where it says summer shiftlet. Mm. So uh, you want me to read it out loud again, or just- uh... You don't have to read it out loud. If you want to read it to yourself and then we can talk about okay. it and do your analysis so through each section. I know it's in the record, sure. Give me one second. Okay, I'm ready when you are. Okay, so at the conclusion, Mr. Wood says, okay, of course he said that. Uh, and then you come back with your uh, analysis at, in the report that says, best practices, mutual activity. Would you explain your analysis in that, case, that particular uh, uh, part of the discussion? Well, yes, it's defining what the mutual activity would be if we have questions, which is I ask you a closed end question, you give me an answer, yes or no, or something similar. And by the way, you'll notice that there's no follow-up to it. So we have questioning here, which is not really el eliciting a response about the witness's opinion on things. It's actually eliciting a response to the questioner's opinion on things. What, do you agree or disagree with what I just said? Do you know or don't you know? And, and that again, in terms of best practices or having an interview is, is not a best practice. This taking place before the interview is also not a best practice because it's really uh, developing a mindset about what interviewing would look like. That's why I say we have a mutual activity problem. And I wanna elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, quite honestly, uh, when you say it's not a best practice, uh, the, the interview, and you didn't go over the interview by the police with Summer Shiflet, but what you're suggesting, correct me if I'm wrong, I want a clarification is that uh, the discussion that Mr. Wood had with Summer Shiflet prior to the police is what you're referring to. Is that correct? Yes. And that discussion that Mr. Wood had with Summer Shiflet prior to the police is, is, is troublesome. Would you agree with that? Well, that's my conclusion, yes. Okay. And it's influential, is it not? I believe based on the responses that I saw in this particular 18 minutes that yes, it was influential. And it would have an impact on Summer Shiflet's testimony. Would you agree? I think it uh, likely would. Okay. Let's move on with the rest of the report uh, that we spoke of. And you talked about after Mr. Wood said, okay, of course he said that best practice is mutual activity again, or I'm sorry, bias stereotyping. Would you discuss your analysis in that regard? Well, this is stereotyping the other defendant uh, because the, of course, he, he said that uh, really is um, a gratuitous statement that um, says, what would you expect, uh, you know, from, from this person? 
so from that standpoint, uh, I would say that uh, it is a stereotypical comment. And much like we have the derogation earlier of the defense attorney for Ms. Vallow, here we have a stereotyping of the other defendant as a person who would, of course, say that. Um, and in, in those regards, if I'm a witness hearing this, I am now getting um, taught how I should think about both of those people. Okay, and then we move on and there's a couple of statements by, or a statement by Ms. Shiflett, Mr. Wood. Um, uh, in essence, the comment is well, welcome to Chad Daybell and you put down uh, best practices, mutual activity, explain that analysis. Yes, uh, it's, it's really the same thing. The mutual activity is the purpose of our meeting. Our, our mutual activity here is to understand on the cast of characters and the theory of the case, who's, um, who's bright, who's not bright, who's bad, who's not so bad. Um, you know, who carries greater culpability, who, who, who really does not, who is a, a better person at one time, who was not. So we have here um, a shaping, if you will, of uh, what people's roles are. And that's why I call this a mutual activity bias. Okay. And this mutual activity bias could, could be uh, uh, understood to mean that you're trying to influence a witness again. Is that correct? Uh it could, yes. Okay, let's go down to the next analysis, which is bias confirmatory at the bottom of page nine of your report. Uh, okay. Um, well, the confirmatory bias that I'm referring to here comes from a statement that is uh, an influencing statement. So, so what I want uh, by the prosecutor is a statement. Uh, that leads to a person either ignoring the statement, denying the statement, or affirming the statement. And in this particular case, uh, as I recall, she initially uh, tends to deny it, but then with one or, or more comments from the prosecutor, uh, she basically acquiesces. Okay, so in other words, uh, in your opinion, uh, initially denying the statement, denying the, this, and then uh, uh, acquiesces, that means she changes her, her uh, statement to the prosecutor after he uh, prompts her with some uh, narrative. Is that a fair analysis? That's absolutely correct. Okay, and that would be, con that would be construed as coercing a witness. Is that fair? Uh, if, if we can put that in context of coercion is on a spectrum. So it can be anywhere from a nudge to a push off of a bridge. And depending on what the prosecutor says here would be somewhere in that, in that spectrum, uh, if, if you wanted to look at it or not. And in that spectrum, it still constitutes coercion of a witness, does it not? Your Honor, objection, asked and answered. Same objection, it was asked and answered. I'm sorry, Judge, I didn't hear your response. The objection sustained. All right, I'll move on, Judge, that's okay. Uh, then if you would be so kind, uh, uh, Dr. Davidson, to read the bottom of page nine and uh, the top of page 10 of your report, and then we'll get into the analysis of those statements as well. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, if you would be so kind as to read Summer Shiflet's statements and then Mr. Wood and go through that so we have a context of what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, on the bottom of page nine, Summer Shiflet, I have my own opinions for him, don't get me wrong. Robert Wood, I bet you do. He is highly manipulative. Summer Shiflet, yeah, he is. Robert Wood, I'm not going to say he's highly intelligent, but you don't have to be highly intelligent to be highly manipulative. Summer Shiflet, absolutely. Robert Wood, he is extremely manipulative, <clears throat> pardon me, and your sister manipulated him in some ways too, <clears throat> but the context for everything that happened came from Chad. Okay, so your analysis starts with best practices, mutual activity. Would you explain that analysis? Um, yes, again, as, as you can see, as this unfolds, the nature of our purpose of being here together, the mutual activity keeps getting refined and defined. And so in this case, um, 
uh, when she says, I have uh, my own opinions, um, he responds not in, in tell, telling or asking, well, tell me about that. Uh, he responds, well, I, I bet you do. And so we really have here a statement that says, I, to me, I bet you do means I'm not really terribly interested in pursuing that. Um, uh, I told you what I was interested in pursuing in, in what I just, just said to you earlier here. And so that's the mutual activity that we're talking about, defining and refining the scope of what the purpose is. Okay, and then uh, bias confirmatory is your analysis uh, based on what you previously read. Uh, explain that to me, would you please? Right, uh, so what we have here are statements to the uh, witness about the nature of Chad Daybell. Uh, Daybell. He is not highly intelligent, he's manipulative, he's very manipulative. Uh, you know, this really is something that all came from Chad. So we have a qualification. Some of it may be from Lori, but it all came from Chad. So we're, we have a, a layout of statements that either can be confirmed or not be confirmed. Uh, and in this particular case, as you'll see in the uh, narrative that developed, the next thing that occurs is she confirms that, that statement. So it's a confirmatory bias. This is what I believe, this is what I wanna hear from you. Yes or no, or no answer. You agree. Okay. All right, and then let's move on to the middle of page 10 where it says absolutely, and then Mr. Wood, unfortunately, and if you would be so kind as to read those as well. Summer Shiflet, absolutely responding to what I just described uh, were statements about Chad Daybell. And then Robert Wood, unfortunately, we have enough evidence to prosecute him and we are. The case against your sister is stronger, but I just, I kind of want to give you just that background. That's the kind of context that we see this guy. This guy came in here and you know, not making excuses for anyone, but kind of blew up this situation and he did not care who died. So you talk about mutual activity, best practices. Uh, right. What's going on there? Well, what's happening is he's just further developing the narrative on his theory of the case. And in developing the theory of the case, depending on the response of the witness, Summer Shiflet, uh, we're going to see whether or not she acquiesces, uh, the impact that it has on what she has to say and so forth. Again, we are miles apart from a meet and greet about, i glad to meet you, here's a purpose today, uh, you're gonna be interviewed by, you know, have a nice time in town. Uh, we have here a full blown uh, exhortation on a theory of a case uh, with her sister and uh, charging and so forth hanging in the balance. Okay. And in your comments, you say that it is apparent the prosecutor is in control of the narrative and there is little interest in the witness information. Would you elaborate on that for me, please? Well, yes. Um, he's not asking for any information. And when there has been disagreements, like I mentioned before, I bet you, I bet you have, or uh, things to that nature, uh, they're really just shut down. Here, uh, we have a situation where he's laying out um, his narrative and not asking anything about her viewpoint, which he would testify to, and how she perceives things. It is his narrative that is controlling this conversation. Okay. All right, uh, and I would actually uh, then ask you to start with the summer shiftlet, uh, and then you have best practices analysis. And if you would be so kind as to uh, recite that uh, narrative as well, so we know what we're referring to. Uh, summer shiftlet responding to the previous narrative says, hmm, uh, Robert Wood continues, who got hurt? And that's an extension of a sentence. And he did not care who died, hmm, who got hurt? He did not care at all, and this is Robert Wood. And the other thing I can tell you is your sister truly believes that everything she's done has been done in righteousness. Summer Shiflet says, I know. Robert Wood says, I know I'm kind of using LDS speak. And then Garrett, uh, the, uh, an attorney says, yeah. Uh, and then Summer Shiflet says 100%. That's my interpretation also. I think she 100% uh, believes. Okay. Uh, the term LDS speak, the reference to LDS speak, what is the significance of that statement? 
Well, it's an ex inclusionary statement um, about a person's religion. So Latter-day Saints, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, more colloquially known as, as the Mormons, uh, it's, it's a alert to the witness that uh, I, I can speak this language. Uh, and it becomes apparent as the narrative unfolds that the witness is very religious and is oriented towards uh, the LDS faith. Uh, and the prosecutor has alerted her to the fact that he is uh, as well. He brought it up, she did not. Okay, and what he's saying to her basically is, I speak the same LDS language you do. Is that fair? Yes, and, okay. and that somehow, somehow is relevant or should be relevant to the nature of our relationship. Okay. Otherwise, why would you bring it up? Okay, and then you go down with your evaluation of best practices, mutual activity. Would you elaborate on that? Well, what's happening now is, is as we refine and define the purpose of our meeting, uh, what we have is we have um, a religious component to it now. So not only am I looking to see if you'll confirm the theory of my case, but I want you to know that I have the same spiritual beliefs that you do, uh, and that that's going to potentially be relevant uh, to how um, I interact with you and maybe even relevant to how this case proceeds. Okay, and then you talk about religious bias on page 11 of your report. Right, so religious bias is when a person brings into play uh, a, a factor, in this case it's religion, it could be a, another group that somebody belongs to and just have a slight change of what the bias would be. But when you have a religious bias, the, the, the purpose of the religious bias um, becomes, again, one of shaping potentially the testimony and the outlook of that particular witness as well as including them now in the in-group. By the way, uh, I also share your spiritual values. That's a new in-group, that's another in-group. And we have now a language which to a person who would not be oriented to the Christian world, uh, we have the term righteousness. And so now we're beginning to speak about uh, terms that uh, are on a completely different planet than uh, the legal issues involved. Okay. And you put some comment in there about uh, adhering to the tenets of her faith. What did you mean by that? Um, well, this goes to, to an in-group, out-group issue. And the, and the issue is, uh, if somebody is a, a believer, a supporter of their faith, not a nominal uh, believer where, yeah, of course, I believe in X, Y, Z, but somebody who adheres to the tenets or the principles, uh, the ground rules, if you will, uh, and the beliefs uh, that are codified for a religion and, and the Latter-day Saints have highly codified uh, beliefs, uh, just like any major uh, uh, faith would have. Uh, so now when we have the tenet of faith coming into play, uh, now we have a concern. For some reason, uh, the LDS aspect has, has been brought up. Now, if I'm a witness do I simply testify about what I have to say, or am I somehow supposed to conform any of what I say to my spiritual beliefs? Uh, this is a little confusing. Uh, now, I'm not speaking for what Summer Shiflet thought nor what Robert would intended, but I'm saying that would be the typical consequence. We bring up an extraneous uh, piece of information that has strong uh, principles attached to it that originally were not part of this discussion. We just wanted to know what you had to say about the case. Well, now when we bring up this extraneous information as a witness, what do I do with this? There, there seems to be an underlying expectation and I had not anticipated this. Uh, am I even more so in the in-group because we share the same faith and what does that mean? Uh, or, or what? That's, that's how I would perceive this. And, and again, we have language like righteousness, which also tends to undergird the whole thing. Okay. And if you would be so kind as to uh, start with Robert Wood, she believes it, and recite that narrative, and we'll, we'll get to your analysis on that section of the recording. Robert Wood, she believes it, Summer Shiflet, mm. Robert Wood, every once in a while, you'll see kind of a little crack in like a jail phone call, but poor Shill and Summer Shiflet says, well, you've heard our conversations too, you know, that I, I get that she's not fully aware of what she's really done. And then we have Robert Wood, right, yeah. And Summer Shiflet, I don't think she is. 
And then Robert Wood. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm going to say this. I think she knows what she's done. Okay, and then you come in with uh, best practices and mutual activity. Explain your analysis there. Well, what we have here is is Summer Shiflet saying, I don't know if she's no no knows like you know exactly what's going on here, and the prosecutor is actually informing him not only of the theory of the case, but presumably of testimony that he'll be able to elicit that says she knows what she's done. You know, in, in fact, she knows what she has done. Uh, and that um, uh, when she says, I don't think she is, he, he's countering that. So again, we have the refining of the mutual activity group. You know, wh what are we doing here? What's the purpose of today? And part of, part of the message now becomes, well, you know, if you want to be in my group, you need to know, I, I know that she knows what she's done. And I'm not interested in you going and saying to me, well, I, I, I'm not sure she does. Uh, plus, we have revelation of information that I would presume is not publicly available as well. Okay, so the read technique is a technique in which uh, uh, when you don't agree with what a witness is saying, you engage in this uh, this technique to influence the witness to change her, uh, her, her thoughts on, on what she's suggesting. Is that fair? That's one component of the read technique and specifically the read technique basically is if you say something that is not in line with the theory of what we want to hear, we will interrupt you or we will counter what you have to say. We will not allow you to develop that train of thinking or that line of testimony. We will block it. And you see here subtle and not so subtle versions of that. And in this particular case, do you have any doubt that this read technique was used by Mr. Wood in the, the paragraphs you just read? I would have tremendous doubt that he, he used a read technique per se because uh, I don't see enough of a, a, co a cohesive technique on anything here. I see more probably a personal style. I don't even know if he knows what the read technique is. I know he's a prosecutor, so I wouldn't be surprised. But the read technique is more oriented toward uh, educating uh, police detectives, police officers on in, uh, interviews and interrogation. But the process of what you're seeing is consistent with aspects of a read technique. So in other words, he may not be completely aware of what the read technique is, but he adopted that process in dealing with Summer Shiflet to change her testimony. Is that fair? I'm not going to go to his purpose of trying to get her to change his test, her, her testimony. I will go to agreeing that he's using uh, aspects of the read technique, knowingly or unknowingly, that have the negative effect of biasing uh, or eliminating and changing a witness's testimony. Okay, so let's go on to the next part of page 11, where it says Summer Shiflet, and if you would read that. Um, starting with, she knew enough to lie to us about it? Yes. Okay, she knew enough to lie to us about it. And then uh, Robert Wood says, um, right, yeah, but she, the context under which it was done was this, religious. Not these ideas were out there. I can say this because I am LDS, no basis in the LDS faith. Just you said it in your phone calls to her. So anyway, that, that's kind of where we're at. And, and we, you know, again, we're just really grateful for you coming in. And it's going to be hard to talk about these things. And Summer Shiflet says, oh, yeah. So between Summer Shiflet and, uh, and um, Robert Wood's statement, you put an analysis that says bias acquiescence. Would you, uh, would you uh, elaborate on that analysis? Well, the acquiescence is at the beginning of what I just read, and it's basically Summer Shiflet going, well, um, on balance, now that I've heard you, well, she knew enough uh, to, to know something about what was going on. So she's agreeing with the narrative that's being presented by the prosecutor in that particular case, even though she initially is qualifying what she's saying, and that's rejected by the prosecutor. Okay. So in your analysis where you say this illustrates prima facie influence of the witness, is that still your conclusion that this is prima facie evidence of influencing of a witness? Absolutely. And that this witness testimony is now reflecting inf influence of the prosecutor rather than untainted narrative. Is that still your, uh, 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 is that still your opinion? It is. I'll object to that. Counsel's testifying. I'm not testifying, Judge. I'm reading what uh, 
Dr. Davidson has in his report, and I'm asking whether it's still his opinion as an expert in this case, that the testimony of Summer Shiflett has been tainted. That's all I'm asking. And if you want me to rephrase, I'll be glad to rephrase. I would ask you to rephrase then. Mr. Right. Based on the previous narrative that you read, was Summer Shiflett's uh, um, testimony potentially tainted by this, uh, uh, this uh, technique? Yes. All right. Let's move on to the rest of your analysis on page 12 of the report. And we'll refer to top of page 12 where it says bias similar to me. Could you offer your opinion on uh, uh, that or offer your uh, review of that uh, particular uh, provision? Well, what I'm responding to here is the prosecutor's statements that what occurred is outside of LDS uh, I would presume outside of LDS teachings or practices in his narrative, uh, and that um, you know what has taken place from a religious aspect uh, is something that, uh, as a person who's knowledgeable about LDS, uh, has is just outside their faith and outside of their beliefs. Uh, and so, in, in this case, where we have similar to me we have the witness having to make the decision, uh, well, now, now who, who do I go with? Uh, I'm hearing not only uh, that um, he's LDS, but he's also now speaking authoritatively about the LDS faith and its practices, and that this did not take place within those practices. So do I agree? Do I disagree? Why are we even talking about this? We, we have here an, a dimension that's been added that um, serves no other purpose except to either create some sort of bond with the, the prosecutor uh, or to create some sort of bunny trail down a religious path in terms of what the testimony might be. So in essence, influencing our testimony. Potentially, yes. Okay, let's start again with Summer Shiflett, uh, the, the middle to top of page 24. And if you would go over the, uh, that analysis uh, after you've read uh, Mr. Sh Ms. Shiflett and Mr. Wood. Uh, so I have, oh yeah, from Summer Shiflett, Robert Wood, we know that, and they're gonna be nice, because obviously, you know, you're not a person of interest. Keep going. Oh, well, let's talk about the explanation and the best practices uh, as in regards to the explanation. Okay. Well, this is a part of the report that I, I think I made clear I don't have information on. Uh, clearly, the uh, recording started after some period of time. And whether that's 30 seconds or 10 minutes or an hour, I don't know how much took place prior to the narrative that I have in the transcript. So here, just uh, in terms of explanation, there, in this 18 minutes, there is no explanation saying you are not a person of interest. Uh, what you have to say here, uh, we're just looking at as a uh, recipient witness, uh, you're, you're not under investigation for anything. Okay, so I'm gonna move around and move down to uh, skipping your analysis uh, on the middle of 24 and go to the summer shiftlet. Okay, I'll do my best, I mean. And if you would start there. Okay, and that's towards the bottom of 12. Yes. Uh, summer shiftlet. Okay, I'll do my best, I mean. Robert Wood, it won't be easy. I know it's going to be a hard, be a hard interview. Summer Shiflet, I was wondering if you would be willing to tell me, if you're able to tell me, if there's any progress in what you know about Tylee and her death. Is there any progress in her autopsy where you understand better? And then Robert Wood says, all I can tell. Well, Summer Shiflet says, I mean, do you have a cause yet or is it close to one? And uh, Robert Wood says, she is at the FBI state-of-the-art crime lab. Unfortunately, there's a lot of deceased bodies there that they're going through. Summer Shiflett says, I'm sure. And Robert Wood says, and so we're not. We don't know really any more yet. We may never know due to the destruction of that body. And yeah, we hope we'll find out. We may not. But obviously, we know it's her. There was soft tissue that was still preserved enough to do DNA tests. Okay. And what is your analysis of that provision? Well, we have several things. Um, we now have uh, a sense from the witness that she's able to approach 
uh, the prosecutor as part of the inner circle now to ask the prosecutor uh, information about the case. Uh, now, again, we're now in a flipped position. Initially, apparently, she was in town to answer questions about her knowledge about anything relevant to the case. Instead, now the prosecutor is being questioned and being asked about knowledge uh, about the death uh, of, of the children. And the prosecutor gives her information. Again, uh, I don't know if this information is in the public domain, but I doubt if it was at that point in time. And I probably I'll take that back. That's just my speculation. Uh, all I know is he provides her with information that is uh, investigatory. And as a witness, knowing that information prior to uh, her providing answers to her interview, to me is potentially highly prejudicial. Uh, it's going into an interview situation where now you've discovered potentially some additional information that may change your perception, your view, and even what you want to say because of what you've learned. So this is an example of really flagrant inner circle bias. The appropriate thing to have been done would be to say, I can't discuss this with you. It's an ongoing investigation. Okay. And then if we could start with the middle of page 13, where it says Summer Shiflet, and go through that narrative. Uh, Summer Shiflet, yeah. Thanks that you guys found them like we wouldn't have ever known, Garrett, yeah. Summer Shiflet, and I would have never dreamed that she would ever hurt them so. Robert Wood, you know what? And everyone says that. Summer Shiflet, yeah. Robert Wood, that's what everyone says. Everyone says that I never would have. So it is, it, it's a tragic thing, Summer Shiflet. It really is, yeah. Robert Wood, but I, again, I just want you to know how grateful we are. I know you know you don't have to talk to us. And so we're just grateful that you're willing to and helping us that way. And it's, I'm sure, kind of difficult knowing that they're asking for information that's going to help them in their case against your sister. But I guess the thing I want you to know is our whole goal is just justice for these kids. And your analysis of that provision? Well, offering thanks for coming, I think is perfectly appropriate and I have no problem with that. But the, the problem, and, and furthermore saying that you may have a tough interview with the police and so forth, I mean, that's fine. Uh, although I think it might actually increase somebody's anxiety more than empathy. Uh, but the concerning part about here uh, is that uh, all we wanna do is we just wanna have justice for the kids is paired with um, you know, they're going to be asking you for information to help in the case against your sister. So we have here an anchor point being tossed out there that says, look, we're looking for information to use against your sister. Again, if we go back to best practices, we're looking to get information. And then we're going to assess what that information does and says to us. And then we're going to determine what we're going to do with it. Not we're going to tell you in advance, we're trying to get information against your sister. Hint, hint, you're in the inner circle. We're LDS here. You've already heard the theory of the case. You've already agreed to different things that I've said in terms of acquiescence. Um, and so I do have a problem uh, with uh, that narrative, uh, just very flagrantly setting the stage for the expectations of what would take place. Okay. And then if we could go on and talk about um, uh, the rest of the uh, statements that are made uh, on page 14 of the uh, report, starting with Robert Wood. Sure. Uh, it starts off at the top uh, after uh, the bottom of 13, where Summer Shiflet says, yeah, an acquiescent statement. Robert Wood, and, and we, our hope, our hope is it comes to it. Your sister's actually made some overtures. She might be willing to talk to us. Summer Shiflet, I hope she does. I pray for that all the time. Robert Wood, we hope she does. She actually was talking about uh, with Chad about talking with us before we found the bodies just a few days before and he talked her out of it. Um, continue. Well, what's the analysis in that provision? Well, the, the analysis is the best practices deal where uh, rather than try to get the witnesses comments about uh, her viewpoint on anything, he again is providing information about the case uh, and that information uh, is going to do nothing uh, helpful uh, in the interview of the witness for her interview to be uh, just a, a uncluttered uh, and unimpacted.
did a narrative of whatever she had to say to the police. So in other words, uh, your analysis is that uh, the likelihood is that that, that discussion with Ms. Shiflett is going to have an impact on Summer Shiflett's testimony with the police. I think it's very likely um, that is a strong concern. Okay. And when you say a strong concern, would you uh, elaborate a little bit on that for me, please? Well, it's a concern that we that she's hearing repeatedly expectations about uh, how this case is going to unfold. She's getting questions answered and given information that is not privy to the, the general public. Uh, it is a concern because that information is going to be in her head when she is asked investigatory questions uh, by the police uh, following this, this 18 minutes and whatever preceded it. Um, we don't have a situation that really is a level playing field with a sterile set of questions being asked. We have preceding questions and instruction that is going to potentially and likely affect her responding. Okay, and when you talk about a level playing field, what you're talking about is two sides of a particular case, i.e. the defense and the prosecution having a fair opportunity with a witness. Is that what you're referring to? Your Honor, I'll object. Counsel's testifying. I'll withdraw that judge and I'll move on. Would you then go with uh, Summer Shiflet mm, at the top of uh, the middle to top of page 14 and review the statements in that going through into through page 15? All right. Summer uh, Shiflet. Sorry. Interrupt here. Before I have you just read that in, we've already got in the record the transcript. We've heard the call as well. It's also in your report. So this is very cumulative to just read it verbatim into the record. If you want to review those, I will review them as well and listen to the analysis. If there's something in particular you think should be highlighted, Mr. Pryor, we can do that, but uh, I don't think it's necessary to just verbatim read this transcript again when it's already been submitted in the, in the hearing. Okay, well, I guess I wanted to put some perspective on exactly what the analysis is with regards to each provision. And, and, and I guess my thought process, Judge, was simply uh, without knowing what provisions we were at talking about, uh, it's difficult for uh, Dr. Davidson to uh, offer his analysis on each of the provisions, but uh, if, if, if I understand you... that, and I can I can read it. Um, it's here before me. Also, I'm just trying to save my court reporter some okay. brief getting through this hearing too. When we already do have the the very record of what's being okay. read. Well, Judge, I mean, at this time, if you would like to take a, a lunch recess, I'll I'll defer to the court's wisdom. Or if you would like me to go on, I'll I'll try to move through this much quicker. Well, I thought maybe we could get through your direct with Mr. Davidson and then uh, take a break before we go to the cross-examination. So if you want to continue plowing along, we'll do that for now. Okay. Thank you. So Dr. Davidson, proceeding or starting on page 14 through 15, there's some discussion uh, between uh, Mr. Wood and Summer Shiflett, and you put in a, uh, a reference saying bias acquiescence. Um, given the fact that the court would prefer not to have each of the provisions read, can you give me in some detail what you mean by that bias acquiescence uh, on page 15 of your, of your report? Um, yes, and I'm just glancing at that section really quickly. Okay. Um, well, basically, there's a narrative here that takes place uh, with the prosecutor. And in the narrative, uh, Summer Shiflett agrees with the comments that the prosecutor makes. So she's not being questioned. Uh, she's being talked to and informed. And, and the acquiescence is she's just now agreeing again, basically with everything that is being said. So the acquiescence is an indication that a person is uh, on board, that they are now in the in-group, that they have uh, decided where they're going to cast their allegiance by and large. Uh, and that is potentially an indicator of uh, testimony later uh, that will be influenced. Okay, now on the, on the bottom of page 14, there's a provision and it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, five comments down and it starts with Mr. Wood. Well, do you see that comment in your report? I do. Would you read that for me really quickly? Robert Wood, well, I'm the visionary guy, so you know, 
So anyway, again, I just wanted to meet with you real quick and introduce myself and Mackenzie Shees. Okay. Now, his comment that I just wanted to meet with you really quick. In your opinion, is an 18 to 20 minute uh, uh, a narrative a real quick meeting? I think it depends on what the content would be. I could conceive of it as a quick meeting if it was uh, a meet and greet uh, without getting into the theory of the case and so forth. But I, I would think typically because the day is set out for an interview by the police and presumably they're waiting or there's an appointment time, you know, five, six, seven, eight minutes. Glad to meet you. Glad you're in town. Uh, hope things go well today. Just wanted to introduce myself would, would be more than enough time. Okay. And then if you would be so kind in the middle of page 15, review your, uh, review the statements that were made on the tape and then let me know when you're ready. Uh, you, are you referring just to not read them out loud? Just review them quietly to yourself. I understand, but are you referring to the top of fifteen to the, the middle, middle of fifteen? The middle of middle 15. down. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, in the middle of fifteen, there's some reference by Mr. Wood. Uh, suggesting that um, Mr. Means is incompetent and that uh, he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, you have analysis at the bottom of your report on page 15 that says bias derogation. Would you please elaborate on that for me? Well, sure. In, in this particular case, um, there's, there's really no purpose and no reason if we're trying to get the witness's testimony to have any discussion about any of the other uh, attorneys or parties or players in this case. And so in this case where uh, the defense attorney is uh, mentioned as incompetent, no experience, lying about the prosecutor, um, and that he basically will uh, be recused from being a defense attorney when additional charges are filed, all really derogate uh, both his reputation as well as his influence, uh, because he's inevitably going to be discharged, uh, his influence is ultimately zero. Uh, he doesn't know what he's doing, so actually his influence could be negative. Uh, and furthermore, he, he's just a liar. So when we have all of this information uh, as in terms of derogation, in terms of influencing a witness, uh, First of all, it'd be very daunting to challenge somebody who is saying this about opposing counsel. It, it would take a pretty gutsy witness to go like, well, hey, wait just a doggone minute. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's fair or that's accurate, uh, especially when we know the stakes that are involved in this particular case. And so the derogation really serves a function to minimize the credibility, uh, in my opinion, of the defense uh, and to further uh, solidify, you're in my group, uh, you're in the in group, we are LDS. Uh, I've told you information about the case. Uh, you know more than the average person. By the way, we don't wanna, we don't wanna go any farther than this we have to. And it's really Chad, it's, it's, she knows, but it's mostly him. Uh, we have here uh, a, you know, a continued pattern that's expanded now very flagrantly with the comments about the defense attorney. Okay, and this is a flagrant display, is it not? I've done this for years. I've never seen anything like this. Okay. Uh, if you would go on with your uh, review of the top of page 16, I believe there's uh, three uh, sections that I'd like you to review and then uh, and uh, describe your analysis of the inner circle bias that you uh, relayed in your report, sir. Right. Um, so he's thinking, uh, the witness for coming in, which is fine. But the witness is then saying how weird this is to be uh, speaking uh, for the prosecution and speaking for the defense um, and, and how she's torn. And, and that's a relevant comment to me because uh, the issue wouldn't be at all how she's torn. The issue should be what evidence does she have to offer through testimony that she may be torn uh, is something that people could always discuss, I suppose, at a different point in time. But for her to bring it up is suggesting to me this conversation has prompted and promoted her feeling torn. 
she she came in and has made some positive statements about her sister earlier in the narrative that were that were not uh, uh, followed up on or regarded. Uh, and now she's pointing out, I, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I'm on the horns of a dilemma. I, you know, I, it, it's weird to be dealing with with both sides in this. So the inner circle bias that comes out of this is, where are you going to land? Uh, how are you going to reconcile that? Uh, who whose side ultimately are you going to to likely be on? Again. If this is an interview situation, ultimately, that's the reason she's here. There shouldn't be a side to land on at all. There should simply be her unfettered testimony. Okay, so your comment, the prosecutor's statement and effort to influence the witness has caused cognitive dissonance. Please explain to me what you meant by that statement in your report of this anal of this these statements that Mr. Wood uh, had made. Right, cognitive dissonance is just a $5 way of trying to say, I'm feeling pressure on, on two different dimensions that are really causing me to struggle. And that's what she points out. Prosecutor, defense, you know, wh where do I go with this? The dissonance is the confusion that that stirs up mentally. You know, what should I do with this? How do I reconcile this? How do I handle this? If I'm asked a question and it draws on me to be loyal to my sister or to her defense, what do I do having heard the theory of the case and the prospects and the information from the prosecutor? There's no reason a witness whose information is simply trying to be garnered should ever be put in the position of having to have that kind of internal battle. They should just be asked, what do they have to say? Not what do they have to decide to impact what they may say. Okay. Okay. If you would be so kind as to uh, read the rest of the narrative on page 16 um, and then uh, discuss your, uh, your findings on the top of page 17. And you could read it to yourself. I am. Okay, so I'm ready. And if you would uh, uh, um, provide us with some uh, interpretation of your analysis in regards to the statements on page 16. Well, what's happening here is speaking just a moment ago about cognitive dissonance or being on the horns of a dilemma, prosecutor versus defense. She elaborates on that a little bit for uh, a few lines, but then she now is comfortable enough to ask about whether or not there's going to have a uh, place on the table um, uh, the death penalty. Uh, is this going to be a case where, um, you know, that will be um, something that will be, that will be thought, I believe. Let me check real quick. Um, yeah. So she, she asked whether there's going to be the death penalty, uh, a capital charge. And again, that's reflecting, she is extremely comfortable now with being in the inner circle of the prosecutor. Uh, because she's asking the person who's going to be responsible for making that capital charge if it does come about. Um, and as far as being on the horns of a dilemma, uh, we see a conversation about that. And we also would have to understand, this is my sister. Now, what do I do? How do I handle this being, and you take all the preceding information, being LDS, being this, being that, what do I do in trying to reconcile this? And how will this affect what I have to say when I am interrogated later today? Questions. Okay. And then if you would be so kind as to um, review uh, page 17 and then offer your evaluate or your, uh, uh, your findings on the top of page 18. All right, so what we have here is uh, a couple of biases that are concerns. Uh, one is the, the mutual activity, again, the refinement and, and the defining of what that means uh, as our purpose. Uh, the purpose has been expanded by the witness who's comfortable enough to ask about the death penalty, but she gets a response instead of that's something I can't discuss. 
uh, or we'll have to determine that later. Uh, so she does get a response and she's informed that that's something that he really doesn't want to do and alludes to how uh, if there was um, really uh, the ability to have perhaps a plea deal, you know, in a capital case in general, that would be life without parole. Um, there's an allusion to that. So now we have the witness who actually has a little bit of power. You know, what can she potentially do to influence her sister if she talks to her on the phone? Because uh, uh, about this capital potential capital charge, he doesn't want to do it. But um, and, and so we have insight into something that typically you wouldn't hear outside the prosecutor's office. You know, they're charging decisions and they're charging con uh, contemplation. So that's a, a mutual activity issue, uh, defining that our mutual activity apparently is to not just hit, have you tell us what you know as a witness, but now we can go to the extent of determining uh, what do you know about how they died? Uh, are you gonna bring up uh, the death penalty for capital charges? Uh, this has become a very, very uh, odd uh, uh, meet and greet prior to being interviewed. And then there's the inner circle bias uh, because she is a member of the in-group. She can go ahead and ask these uh, really high value questions. Are you, are you gonna charge my sister with, with capital murder? Okay, now you made some reference uh, in your report on page 16, and I'll go back to that very ever so briefly. Um, and you said that, uh, um, well, I may have that incorrect. In your report, you had referenced the fact that she now becomes a member of Mr. Wood's inner circle. Is that your assessment of what uh, uh, the provisions were referring to? Right, that's, that's part of what I just mentioned as being part of the inner circle. Uh, you know, now, now it, we really uh, see pretty strong evidence that she has adopted that viewpoint. She is part of the inner circle. She, she's asking case specific information, including charging information, and she's getting answers. So specifically what you're saying, and, and please correct me if you, uh, I'm wrong, at this point, uh, this witness has adopted the prosecutor's theory of this case. I don't know to what extent, but she is acquiescing to what he has to say. She's comfortable enough as part of the in-group uh, to ask these kinds of questions. Uh, it, it certainly would appear to me that she is influenced um, strongly by the information she's heard and the questions okay. she's asked. Well, let's go on to read to yourself page 18. Um, actually, you know what, I, I think, um, yes, let's read page uh, 18. And then we'll talk about your uh, um, findings on the top of page 19 when you're ready. Okay, give me a second. Okay, I'm ready. Go ahead. Well, we have a bias about religion uh, because it's being said to her very clearly that, uh, you know, he's the one that really is a religious influencer in all of this, uh, as well as uh, how his views uh, on theology and Latter-day Saint uh, beliefs uh, manipulated uh, Miss Fallow. Uh, so we have um, a shifting of responsibility to Chad Daybell, part of the theory of the case, uh, maybe a sigh of relief to the sister in her testimony. Uh, and uh, from that standpoint, the religious aspect becomes a piece of the overall uh, judicial picture where it doesn't make any sense to have it be a piece at all. Uh, and certainly doesn't make any sense, and, and this is an X bias in terms of inner circle, to have the prosecutor pass on further his theory of the case that that the main culprit in this is Chad Daybell. And it came about uh, partly because of religious reasons and so forth. Uh, so we're way beyond again, just you're in town for an interview. Okay. And then what you did is you made a number of findings and I'm not gonna have you go over those. The report speaks for itself about those particular findings. Uh, um, What I do want to do is go to your conclusion page on page uh, 22. Okay. 
Let's start with acting ethically, the American Bar Association. Well, there's, there's going to be model rules of professional conduct for the ABA. And uh, I simply noted in my report, I'm not an attorney, I'm, a, uh, I'm an associate member <laughs> for what it's worth, but I, I have no basis to make any comments about uh, prosecutorial conduct related to the ABA model rules of professional conduct. It's outside the scope of my right. uh, capability. Okay, acting with integrity, uh, and you're talking about Idaho Criminal Code 182604 sub three, which is talking about, uh, it's a crime to influence a, uh, or uh, uh, coerce a witness. And uh, what did you include that in your report for? Well, I included that because the efforts in this 18 minutes, to me, uh, adversely affect the, con the concept of free, full and truthful testimony. Now, maybe not truthful, but certainly free and full. And so I'm simply suggesting from my opinion as a forensic psychologist, that there was improper influence of the witness in this case by the, by the prosecutor. So your comment under acting with integrity on page 22 of, of the 24 page report is that the efforts of the prosecutor in the interview that I analyzed suggested improper influence of the witness. Is that still your finding? Um, yes. Okay. Avoiding the next section is avoiding inappropriate interviewer behavior. Would you uh, provide us to your analysis on that conclusion? Uh, let me glance real quick. Um, sure. Uh, so here, um, very straightforwardly, um, you know, greeting a person, uh, asking open-ended questions and so forth. Uh, in terms of interview behavior, we really don't have an interview. Uh, it's a simple process. We don't have anything asked beyond one question about Chad Daybell. So the efforts that I see in this narrative have nothing to do with an interview of a witness brought into town to be interviewed. They have to do with uh, influencing that witness, um, period. Okay. And then I want to go down to uh, the middle of page 23 of your report, where it says the witness is a vulnerable witness, and then uh, provide your analysis of that provision. Okay, well, the witness is a vulnerable witness because of her relationship to the defendant. She's her sister. And to that end, uh, anyone would acknowledge that that's an emotional uh, relationship. Uh, of one dimension or another to the point uh, that she has asked the prosecutor about whether or not capital charges will be brought. Uh, so a vulnerable witness, a person who emotionally is highly involved in a situation uh, is a person that really needs to have uh, the utmost professionalism in their questioning and in their treatment and in their handling. And the reason is because their vulnerability makes them more susceptible than the average person uh, to having their comments be suppressed, be influenced, be uh, exaggerated. Uh, you can go in whatever direction. It's going to vary according to the person. Uh, but that's why I raised a concern about her as a vulnerable witness, because I believe she is one. Okay. And then the next uh, paragraph, the interview with the prosecutor provides the witness. And if you would elaborate on that uh, conclusion. <clears throat> Well, I think that the thing here we have is uh, really kind of fencing in the witness in terms of what's okay to believe and, and who she should align with and what's not. So we, we have it be known that, uh, you know, the defendant's manipulative, he's wimpy, he's outside of LDS doctrine. Uh, he is a person that probably is, is the main bad actor in all of this, uh, which, um, you know, may or may not influence what she would say about her sister, but you would think that it would, uh, because if he's really the bad actor, then you don't have much to lose by saying whatever you care to about the sister, especially since you know the prosecutor does not want to bring capital charges and would prefer to have this case be somehow settled, perhaps. And then we have from there the defense attorney's malignment, um, really, again, putting a fence in, going like, hey, whatever's going on on that side, not going to last, not going to be there. He's lying. He's, he's incompetent. So don't pay any attention to that. Uh, I've answered your questions. I, I have, I have uh, cooperated with you. I've told you what's going on. Uh, I'm your ticket. 
Okay, and then the next paragraph says the, the prosecutor specifically asked the witness to consider various aspects. And if you would el elaborate on your uh, conclusion in that paragraph. Uh, well, in various times, I want you to consider, I want you to suggest thinking about, I'm paraphrasing a little bit liberally here, but she is really asked to consider and told the theory of the case. And so when that occurs, it basically in, in my world, in forensic psychology, you consider that coaching. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I think is accurate. Uh, I'm, you're agreeing with me. I have acquiescence. Let's keep going. Well, I answer your question. Now, now you're in the in group. So the, the impact of all of this is to, again, go back to the concept of co-opting. We're bringing that person into the circle. And now that person is highly vulnerable to providing uh, information that will be favorable uh, to the prosecution and not to the defense in the sense that it may not be brought up, it may not be answered fully, it may be suppressed, uh, who, who knows? But the impact of all of this is not neutral and it certainly is not favorable to the defense. It is adverse to a, any defense and it is favorable to the prosecutorial position. Okay, and if you would be so kind, and this will be my last question, uh, would you read the last paragraph of your report for me, sir? It strains credulity to think that the efforts of the prosecution had no impact on the subsequent testimony of the witness. It is apparent during the interview that she seeks to please the prosecutor with her responses, being begins to volunteer information in an apparent effort to help him. It is likely that the subsequent interview of the witness has been influenced and tainted by the nature of the initial interview with the prosecutor. So is it your position then that this witness has been influenced by uh, Mr. Wood's conduct during that 18 minute discussion? It is. All right, Judge, I have no further questions. Prior, well, let's uh, take our lunch break at this time. We are starting late, but we'll do a one hour lunch break. So we will be back on the record at 1.40 PM. Does that give everyone sufficient time to do what they need to do during the break? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. yes. All right, thanks. We'll see you all back in an hour. Mr. Davidson, uh, we'll continue with your testimony after that. Thank you, or Dr. Davidson, I should say. Thank you, Your Honor.